words are powerful. They can change reality, change our emotions. They can start a war. They can make you feel loved. And you don't even need many. Some words just work all on their own. Say somebody asks you to marry them or somebody offers you a job and you say, yes, that is a future changing word. And now maybe over you is a new word, maybe the word engaged or employed. I know some of our students will be hoping to be graduated soon. I'm sure their parents are as well. Or maybe you go to the doctors and there's the word healed. The, the results came back and they're clear. Words have power, but there's other words. Words like failed, lost, died, divorced, cancer. These are power-packed words, future-shaping words. You hear them and everything can change. Words are powerful. And I'm not going to say that those words don't matter, but there is a word that puts those words in their place. And I, I don't know what word you come in with tonight what word you feel is hanging over you this evening. But there's a word that Jesus has for us, a word that he says on the cross, that as we hear it, as we start to understand it, as we start to receive it, transforms everything, has the power to change our life. The story that we've heard so far is that Jesus has been arrested on false charges. He's been put on a show trial. They mock him and beat him, and then they nail him to a cross, which was the worst form of execution ever invented. It's slow, it's painful, it's shameful. And yet on the cross, Jesus' behavior is extraordinary. Even at the height of pain and the depth of shame, Jesus is thinking about others. He, he looks, as we heard in our reading, at his mother and calls on his friend to look after her. He looks to his left and, and sees somebody else crucified alongside him and, and speaks a word of comfort to him. He even looks at those who are killing him and speaks a word of mercy to them. Right to the very end, Jesus is thinking of others, and then he says this, thinking of us. Later, knowing that everything had been finished, and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk on, of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he'd received the drink, Jesus said, to tell us die meaning paid in full. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus' final word speaks to our foundational problem. What is our foundational problem? Well, it gets described in many different ways. But one of them is this nagging sense that we owe a debt that we owe a debt maybe to God or to the universe or the world or even to ourselves. And this debt sits on us and it holds us back. And often people struggle to describe the debt, but they know the outworkings of it. That, that, that this debt produces feelings of guilt and feelings of shame, which drives us towards the pressure to perform that somehow we owed a better life. And we can't get away from it. It's like, it's like we carry this bucket around with us. And this is the bucket of the debt we owe. And we're constantly trying to fill it by, you know, we're haunted with this need to fill it with, you know, our good works, which are sort of pennies into the, into the bucket. And, uh, and, and we're not very good at getting them into the bucket sometimes. And this one's not even the right currency. I don't know what country that one's from. And, and, and this one's not even a coin. This is a battery. Uh, we don't have 
what's need to pay off the debt. And Jesus says, this feeling isn't fake. That each of us do owe a debt, not to others, not to ourselves, but to him. Because instead of living towards him, we've lived a life towards ourselves. That's probably the simplest understanding of the word sin. That the sin in our lives mean we live out of sync, out of relationship with God. Out of sync and out of relationship with others. And even weirdly, out of relationship and out of sync with ourselves. That's one of the outworkings of sin. That like, if there were two of you, they wouldn't get along. And it's a big claim. And maybe you disagree. You know, some people find the word sin offensive or uh, old-fashioned, but every person needs an answer to the question of what is wrong with the world and what is up with me. And, and do you know what? This is the best description that I've come across of the problem, but also even better, it comes with the most wonderful solution of how it can be resolved. And the solution is Jesus' word, to tell us die. And he picked that word very intentionally. Like it, it was a, a word, it was pretty, um, you know, in his, his language, it's one word. In ours, it takes three, usually translated paid in full or it is finished. And, and there's so much in it. It was a regular word. It was used in normal day. It was a word used by builders when at the end of the day, they reported to the foreman to tell us die. The work is done. It was a word used by artists when they finally abandon, when they can't add or subtract anything from the artwork, they would say, to Telestai, it is finished. It was used by soldiers as a battle cry, to Telestai, you are finished because we are going to finish you. Uh, it's used in so many different ways, but the way we're going to lean in tonight is that it was also used by money lenders and traders and loan sharks. If you borrowed money, a record would be kept of your debt a list of everything that you owed. And, and you know what, back then, that is, you know, that's life and death. Because if you didn't pay back your debt, there wasn't bankruptcy, there was slavery. They would own you. And so bit by bit, you would try and sort of pay off your debt. And if you were able to pay it off, if you filled up your debt bucket, you paid off every last penny that was owed, they would take a stamp and it would say, to tell us time. And it would be stamped on your record, paid in full. And therefore you owed no more money. They could ask you of nothing else. There was nothing else to pay. And I want to try and help us receive that tonight. Jesus is constantly saying that he went to the cross for us. Can I get that water, please? <coughs> he went to the cross for us. And so what he did on the cross, he wants it to land in our lives. He wants us to be able to feel the difference in our lives. And we're going to see very quickly how this lands in any debt or in any lack that you feel in the area of guilt or shame, or your identity. You can know to Telestai, paid in full. And to help us receive this, uh, the amazing creative team have come up with this idea that on your seats, you should find a little receipt that's been printed um, that is for you. And on it, there are three lines. And you might find it helpful as we go through um, to write on it. If you need a pen, give a wave and uh, some of the team or, or bring a pen to you. But as we go through it, as we look at this debt of guilt, this debt of shame and this debt in our identity, you might find it helpful to write something on it in that area. And then at the end of the talk, we're all going to have an opportunity to respond by coming to the foot of the cross. And there's a stamp that says paid in full. And you can stamp it so that you can know that if Jesus is offering it, I've taken hold of it. So, firstly, the first way this lands in our life is that it deals with our guilt. Guilt can feel like a debt. 
Like it feels like it, it drags. It feels like this thing that we have to pay but can't. And guilt is a horrible feeling, even when it's false guilt. <coughs> like um, one time, um, we used to live overseas and we were doing this work in this kind of rural area. And the wonderful thing about this town was it was full full of wild dogs. Um, only they weren't just wild dogs. They were kind of like wild but tame dogs. They were quite friendly. But what that meant was there were loads of wild but tame puppies. Oh, it was amazing. It was like a slice of heaven. Wild but tame puppies everywhere. So cute. Anyway, I arrived one day to where we were working and uh, it was so sad. One of the puppies had been hit by a car and it had been killed. I'm, I'm sorry, sad story. Um, but it was still in the road, and that meant that all of its little tame but wild puppy siblings were coming up to it to kind of nudge it, and, and that meant they were now in the road, and they were at risk of getting hit by a car, and I didn't want it to be an even sadder story. So I pulled the car over, uh, kind of haphazardly by the curb, jumped out, grabbed a spade, and I was going to move this dog, and I, and I bent down, and I picked up this little puppy on my spade, and just as I lifted up, a minibus came slowly round the corner, filled with people staring at me, looking at me, basically saying, you killed that puppy. And it was like, it was like, no, like, I was like, I felt so guilty, even though like, I knew there was nothing to feel guilty about, but it was like a, a drive-by jury handing down a verdict on me of puppy killer. Full guilt feels awful, but actually true guilt feels even worse. And I know there's a lot of things in my life that I feel true guilt for. There are things I've done or, or not done, things I've said or left unsaid. And Jesus says to Telestai, paid in full. How is our guilt debt paid? Well, what Jesus is saying here is that we owed a good life and there was nothing we could do to, to pay it off because actually well, we haven't got any currency. We haven't got any coins because even our good works, well, that's not a bonus. That's just what we were supposed to be doing anyway. And we've all owed a good life and we've all fallen short. And the wages of that falling short are death. That when we make ourselves the center of our worlds. That's death to friendship. That's death to intimacy with God. That's death to life and joy. And so Jesus, knowing that we could do nothing, came and he lived the life that we should have lived. And he died the death that I should have died. And he went to the cross in my place. And in doing so, he paid our debt so that we could know that our guilt is forgiven to Telestai. It is paid in full. There is nothing left to pay because in his life and in his death, he covered it all. And if there's anything that you want to know is dealt with, if you want forgiveness for anything, you can write that on that top line. And at the end, you'll be able to come forward and stamp it and know to Telestai, it is paid in full. But actually, the word goes deeper than just our guilt debt. Because if it just was about our guilt, then well, you could, you could still feel shame. Because you could go, well, well, I know I'm forgiven, but I still feel bad that I'm the kind of person who would have done those things and so needed to be forgiven. And, and there is this debt, therefore, of shame that many people carry around. And the other weird thing about this is it's not just about the shame of the things we have done, there's also the shame of the things that have been done to us or the shame of the things that have happened around us. And the word tetelestai removes our debt of shame, not because of what is said, but because of who says it. The antidote to shame is honour. And God didn't send someone else to do the job. He came himself. Shame seeks to isolate and Jesus comes close. That is how much you are honoured, that the Son of God loved you and gave himself for you to die in your place. Is there any area in your life where you feel shame? 
you can know that it is paid in full. You might like to write it down, or, or you, you, I wouldn't want you to feel embarrassed or, or worried that someone might see it. This it's is just, just you, but you, but you might you just might want just to put, put a, a line, line on, on your, your paper. paper. God, God knows, knows, you, you know, know, but it means, but it means you, you, can, you can stamp it to know that this is paid in full. In every area of our life where we feel shame, he honors us by being there. If you feel shame about your body, he took on human form. If you feel shame in weakness, he became powerless. If you feel shame by association, he was the friend of addicts and outcasts. Whatever area you feel shame, you can know that it is paid in full because he was present at it when he died on a cross. The cross was the most physically and spiritually and bodily shameful that can happen to a person and God honours it with his presence. Whatever you have been through, God honours you with his presence. Your shame is paid in full. And lastly, the final debt is probably the one that we feel most acutely in our particular cultural moment, in our corner of the earth, in the West at this moment. And this is the identity debt that drives us to the need to craft and present a perfect picture of who we are to the world. I think I think the emotional journey is a bit like this. Well, yeah, the guilt debt is paid and the shame debt is paid, but now it's up to me. Jesus died so I could try harder, right? Like, you know, do better next time, live your best life now, and this crushes us. And what's interesting is more and more people are picking up on this. You're seeing it in the press over and over again. I read this recently by Freddie DeBoer, a writer uh, in Brooklyn. He asks, why is everybody such a wreck? Why is everyone such a wreck? He says it's strange, right? We have a self-help culture that is constantly telling us we are wonderful, we are brilliant, we are unique. You know, all of our marketing around us is affirming us. Like, have you seen that gym advert that's saying, join our gym and join the body acceptance movement? And it's like, I have, that's why I've not joined your gym. It's like, we've got this incredible social media tool that allows us to craft the perfect, idealized version of ourselves, curated to the millimeter so that we can present to the world exactly the kind of self we want to be and yet none of it works. We keep having to come back to it over and over again like the sacrifices made over and over again in the temple. They never satisfied. And Freddie de Boer, he says this, I see people who are the most outwardly secure and confident. They never betray a hint of doubt or guilt or remorse. They are popular and successful. They have money and respect. And yet, and yet, the flow of their lives reveals that inside they hate themselves. None of that stuff matters. None of it gets to the core self-hatred within. And I'm beginning to wonder, is this the human condition? And for us, the identity debt is ramped up to the full. Because in our culture, in our time, and, and you know, we are the first culture in the history of the world that says this is a good way to live. Our culture says that you decide who you are. And no one can tell you who you should be. You have to look within and then live that out. But the result of that is now we desperately need to be affirmed and recognised by everyone. We have the most fragile identities in the history of the world because they only have one architect, me. And they only have one builder, me. And not only that, we then place the greatest burden on that identity that anyone has ever attempted in the history of the world because we say that finding that identity, expressing that identity is the most important thing about you and it's where you find your worth and value and your purpose and you have to find that worth because you have a debt to pay because you owe it to yourself and all the social media all the self-help and all the likes and all self-esteem do you know what they are they're just pennies in the bucket only it's not a bucket it's a coal mine because if actually you are made in the image of God, if you are valued so much that the Son of God would come to die for you, the debt is enormous. 
because your value is so great? How does Jesus pay the identity debt? Because of what his word echoes. There are two other places that this word is used. One is in the creation story, that God creates the world and he says, this is good. And then he creates us and he says, this is very good. And then he says, it is finished and God rests. Jesus, as he uses that word, he's saying, I created you. And yes, things have gone wrong, but on the cross, I am recreating you. And now the work is done. There is nothing you can do to make me love you more. I love you as you are, where you are, as you are, not as you should be, but as you are, you are now. I don't love the future you, I love the now you. The other place that that word is used was in the temple when sacrifices were bought as a picture of ultimately what Jesus would do for us on the cross, the sacrifice had to be perfect. And so a priest would check the animal and then it would lift it up and would say to Telestai, to say, it is finished, it is good enough, it is perfect. And so when Jesus uses that word, it's as if he is holding you up and he's looking at you and he's saying, because of the cross, you are finished, tetelestai, you are loved. What do you want to write on that last line? Is there an area of your identity that is marked with striving? Is there an area of your life that is marked with anxiety? Is there a failure you're afraid of, a weakness you're worried about? It is paid in full. You are already loved. The cross says you are more sinful than you ever realized, and yet you are more loved than you ever dared hope. Jesus' last word to us is our first word. Where his life ends, ours begins. Where he died, we come alive. Because everything Jesus came to do, everything he came to give you, everything he wanted to express to you, he did it on the cross. He covered it all, paid in full. Amen? Now we're going to take this as an opportunity to receive it. And the band are going to come and play behind us. But as I said before, um, at the cross here, there are four stations. And on each one is a stamp and an ink pad. And as the band play, you're invited to come up and to take one of these stamps, fill it with ink, and then on your receipt, stamp it, paid in full, as a sign of saying, Jesus, if you've done this, then I want to receive it. And the great thing about it is that you don't have to fully understand it to say, Jesus, I want in. If you just think, actually, I've heard enough, I want in, Jesus, I don't know all the details, but I need this you can say, I'm coming up in faith to receive it. And so I'm just going to pray now, and then we're all going to have a chance to respond. Jesus, we thank you that you loved us and that you died for us. I ask for every person in this room that you would come, and as we respond physically, you would help us to know what we stamp on this paper deep down in our hearts and in our words and in our minds and in our thoughts of you and our thoughts of ourselves. that we would know that we are loved. Holy Spirit, you come so that we can know we are loved. Pour out your love in this place, we pray. Amen. Amen. So why don't we stand? And there doesn't need to be an order to this. It'll probably be a little bit messy. Um, But as we sing now, take this as an opportunity to come forward and as a sign say, Jesus, I want in. I want this for my life in these areas, in my guilt, in my shame, in my life, my identity. And we're going to do that as a community now. And people are already coming. Here's the fourth one. Let's worship and let's respond.